Hello, and welcome to Fair Start's Guest Chef Night at Home. I'm Emily Diddy, the Chief Development Officer at Fair Start. Tonight, I'm joining you from the Fair Start Restaurant Kitchen. Before we get started, and to help center equity in our work and conversation, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on a journey, and while there's so much more to be done, we want to start by acknowledging we are on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, and specifically stand on the lands of the first peoples of Seattle, the Duwamish. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish peoples who have stewarded it, past and present. For almost 30 years, Fair Start has been transforming lives, disrupting poverty, and nourishing communities through food, life skills, and job training. Last year, when COVID hit, we transformed our kitchens and redeployed staff to help make sure our neighbors across the Seattle area didn't go hungry. To date, we produced over three and a half million meals. We're also supporting students through virtual job training, case management, and wraparound support to help provide pathways for economic stability. The way we do our work might look a little different right now, but we know how important these programs are for sustaining and transforming lives. We are so excited to be with you for a virtual version of our guest chef night to support our local chefs and restaurants, build community, and have a great time. If you have questions throughout the event, please put them on the chat. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can within the chat. This event is completely free, but if you want to support the work of Fair Start, we would welcome your donations at fairstart.org. Now, let's get the evening started with the very excellent Chef Wayne Johnson. Thank you, Emily, and good evening, everybody. I am Chef Wayne Johnson. I'm excited to be here with two incredible chefs, and even better than that, my friends, Chef Brenda McGill of Hitchcock Restaurant and Natalie Evans of We Be Gammon Bakery and Fair Start tonight. It's all about practicing preservation or preserving and hone our jam making and fermentation techniques. So we're gonna be jamming tonight. Chef Natalie, thank you for being here with us tonight. So great to see you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is great. So. You know what? I've been in this kitchen, you've been in this kitchen a dozen times with our students, preparing food, doing catering events. And now I learn you got your own bakery, you got things going on, you're going to do a little bit of jam tonight. Talk to us a little bit about your bakery and where it's at. Well, um, actually, We Be Jammin' is a bakery concept, and um, it actually started back in 2015 when I lived on the East Coast. I left my job, and I ended up starting my own business because I was like, hey, I'm talented. I'll make money off of myself. So I um, started this business, and I it was a concept with just jam and bread, and I also um, sold my jam and bread at like three different farmers markets in, within the uh, community in Maryland. And so um, I moved here about six years ago and um, and last year, actually, no, earlier this year, fr uh, February. I, hey, COVID did it to all of us, you know, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I really had got so, a really great opportunity to uh, work with some of the uh, farmers and just have some farm friends. And so um, they gave me a really great opportunity to just launch my my business. And so here we are. We Be Jamming is launched and uh, I've been selling about three three favorite types, which is um, Marion Berry, Marion Cinnamon. I'm sorry, Marion Berry with cinnamon and hibiscus. And then there's a cherry and raspberry um, jam. And then there's also a um, orange, carrot and pineapple marmalade. And then um, the one is that's really everyone's favorite is strawberry hibiscus champagne. That's you got, a, you got a lot of flavors going on. So what are you yeah. going to do here tonight? What are you going to show the... So tonight I figure like, you know, I'm doing a little spin off of the... I love marmalade. and It wasn't my favorite when I was a kid, but I really like um, orange marmalade. And I just like the fact that there's natural pectin inside of these fruits. So I don't have to go to the store and buy pectin. And um, also like my jams are really uh, more about like my Caribbean uh, roots. So... I want to focus in on, you know, berries and tropical uh, uh, exotic fruits and super fruits. So Washington's a really great place to live. And there's so many wonderful exotic fruits here that, you know, 
It's one of the largest berry making states. So let's get started. Yeah. With some uh, making some jam. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, actually I'm going to cut into this, this pineapple, because we're going to get it out the way. Okay. OK. All right. <laughs> Give me a knife. Mm -hmm. So pineapple is really, really great as far as like, I like to save the skins too. I wash it really good, save the skins and also we'll make like um, a tea yep. with the pineapple. So it's really helpful to for your for your digestive system. Total utilization, you know, put some ginger in the pot, some pineapple skins, maybe a few uh, star anise, and then just cook it up into a tea and it's nice and sweet. You can drink it hot or cold. So, but we gonna throw this away today. <laughs> <laughs> compost, <It's> compost. Compost, <laughs> exactly, compost. Yeah, so. Well, and I've been working with a lot of farmers and this whole composting thing is, so big and so cool that yeah. we're getting away from all that fertilization, you know, yeah. in the ground. It's so natural. It's really cool to watch how uh, things break down in the earth, you know. It gets all nice and hot. Yep. I'm being all perfect with this, you know. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I've always loved about your being in our kitchens is... Students didn't get to like play around because you always want it like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Do it yeah, right. you know, it's like have respect for the food and, you know, love what you're doing. And I really liked when we, you know, we had the the students in the kitchen because they um, they all came with their own creativity. Mm -hmm. So I like that, you know, like to pull that out of them and give them some sort of freedom to be themselves, even in their cooking. Because I'm like, don't nobody like an a angry chef. And so that translate into the food. Into the food, right? <laughs> so, you know, we all were happy in the kitchen. Who, who wants some angry jam, right? Yeah, we don't want any angry <laughs> jam. But we were all was just like really happy in the kitchen. And, you know, the Fair Start program was um, really good. The uh, empowerment skills that they learned was uh, pretty amazing because that also kind of came into the kitchen, too. That's right. Owning their greatness. So I'm not going to use all of this. Okay, I'm just going to drop this right here. Okay. All right. It's going in. So I'm looking at your pot. It looks like it's a special pot. Mm-hmm. Do I have to have one of those to get started with? No, you don't. Um, I actually have this because um, I have it because it cooks jam evenly, and it's just it's really good for... Um, for like the bulk, I'm doing a lot of a jam making. Yeah, so yeah. I don't want it to be inside of a pot that's going to be, um, you know, it's going to stick to the bottom and it's not going to, you know, cook evenly. But you do want kind of a, if I'm at home, I do want kind of a heavy bottom pot so I get that even cooking. Yeah, yeah, heavy bottom ones, pot. Those thin ones burn in spots, you know, real right. fast. Yeah. But the copper, you know, even if you can get a little copper pot, that'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, normally... Hey, Christmas is coming. Put it on your list. <laughs> Somebody gonna get you a copper pot. <laughs> Give me a copper pot for Christmas so I can make jams at home. I just cut off the tips of these oranges, which you shouldn't do because not not for this particular technique. Um, I should have just cut them in half, but I just wanted to point that out that that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> so, so right you, now you, I'm just juicing. And are you using the peel? Yes, I will use a peel because it has this natural pectin. I'm actually going to be using all of this stuff. So I'm going to, um, I will need a spoon, Chef Wayne. I mean, I don't mean to run you in the <laughs> kitchen, but I need a spoon because we'll get this spoon right I'm going to need to like scoop out some of this, um, this pulp? orange pulp. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I'm going to use everything. I'm going to put it inside of a cheesecloth and that's going to be our natural pectin for this. So, Chef Wayne, do you make jams at home? I have only maybe made it once. And you know what? When I was in, this is years ago, now I'm from my age, I was in <laughs> Colorado. And I actually had to act like a baker 
You had like, to act like a like, how you had to act like a baby for like three months. <laughs> Thank you. I was no. This is this is a true story. Mm -hmm. So I'm a line cook, and you know line cooks and pastry chefs, chefs and Not the savory same. chefs and pastry chefs are. Oh, that's me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They they are totally different. Wait, let me uh turn this off. We gonna stop the thing? Or y'all just gonna take it out? I'm sorry. I thought I turned this off. That was my dad. Sorry. <laughs> so, so no, for real. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a savory chef. I'm working the line. Right. We did not have a pastry chef for three months. What? And since I was working the night line, and they had, we had to have like all the sweets ready for the breakfast. I ended up having to proof and <laughs> do jam, do jam in the middle, what? bake it. Yeah, I'm like, I did it for three months. And I'm screaming up and down, I need a pastry chef. I need a pastry chef. Yeah, it's such grueling work, ain't it? I was leaving. They brought a pastry chef the week that I left. So The week that you the left. The week that I left. After that, you, all that, you just had to leave. Then so I haven't made jam since. <laughs> I'm like, nope. <laughs> Not again. Nope. But okay. I, I mean, now I'm looking at what you've got going on here. I'm, I might make some jam. You might make some. This is, you know, this, it's, it's not really this, hard. This, this season, I might mean, be doing some jam. Yeah, it's really not that hard. Um, I do need one more thing. And that's, that's right. a, a, a strainer. I, I forgot to ask for a strainer so I can strain, <laughs> strain this out. All right. Let's get um, strainer. We'll strain it. We'll strain it? Okay. Well, while I'm waiting, well, yep. they gave you the spoon. Spoon right here for you. All right. Thank you. Mm hmm all right, so while I'm waiting for the strainer, I'm going to, well, this is a fancy spoon. You know, the ones at home got like a tighter edge on them. <laughs> so I'm just going to be opening these up. If um, It's easier when you just can take it out with the spoon and and uh, just clean it out. But we're at home, so right. we got to do what we got to do. Make it work. So this is the type of work that goes into... You know, making jam and um, when you make, even when you make your your own foods and stuff. I'm gonna put this in a cheesecloth. Just start my little cheesecloth here, so that this is where all the pith, the trash and stuff from the inside is gonna go in here. Oops. But I think just for those watching the show, when you work with cheesecloth, usually it's really dry and it's hard to get into it. Mm -hmm. what, what we like to do in our kitchens is get it wet, and then you can pull it apart pretty easily. And also, I guess when you actually get it into the, the pot, mm -hmm. yeah, then it, it's it'll sucking just, up the juices. Right. It's already wet. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Wonderful. All right. So I got all these to go. Oop. You, um, I mean, I, I see you're taking a piss with the, the actual zest. Mm-hmm. All of that got that, packed in there. That, that's going to get chopped up differently or? Oh, you mean this, this here? Yeah. yeah, this is going to get chopped up. Okay. That's where we get the, uh, that's where we start with the other knife skills, the julienne. <laughs> julienne. <laughs> yeah. That's where you got your other knife skills. I mean, you know, you can also do um, in julienne or, you know, some people just cut them up in cubes. But julienne is one of my favorite cuts. So, and I, I like it. It looks pretty. Yeah, I'm, I like I'm, to have the different shapes. Like I'm just thinking, I was on your website and I was seeing that and how they're when it breaks down nice and evenly mm -hmm. in that jar, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and then you know, with canning, it's cool because you know you're just like really preserving the season. And most of the time, when you make jam, you know the shelf life is like um, up to a year. So it's really good. 
I wish so I could you, call, be like, Chef Wayne, come on in, come help. I, I'm, 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 I'm feeling like I want to jump in. <laughs> um, I, I guess what's cool about that is because if you're going season by season mm -hmm. as you make your jam. Um, yeah, you have to you, watch it. You got to have a plan for it. Well, it's like during strawberry season, you do a bunch. Mm -hmm. And actually in the winter, you still can have strawberry on your toast. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, one of the things I learned this year about um, working with farmers and, and jams, I mean, you know, just getting fresh berries and um, sourcing my ingredients locally was like, once the season comes, you got to be ready for it when the fruit's ready. And so there was a lot of learning for me. Um, one of the things that I truly missed out on was the, uh, apricots. Mm. I mean, especially with the, the, the heat that we had and, you know, there's a lot of things that affect the way, um, food is produced. Right. And so I had to deal with, I had these labels made and I was ready to go. And then by the time my labels were, were arrived, they arrived, the season was done. And then. Then you think like, oh, what could I have done better? Uh, maybe I could have purchased them and then froze them, but freeze them. Right, right. You know, but I like to work when the fruit is fresh right off. Coming off the tree. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever worked with the, the Seville <laughs> The Seville oranges? oranges? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually the best orange to actually make marmalades with. Okay. So. Because of the high pectin? Mm-hmm. Yep. Good flavor. Um, sometimes they're definitely, uh, there are some oranges that are bitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you, you know, you just don't know it until you do it too sometimes. So I'm, I'm thinking we're talking pectin and the balance is a little bit different in different fruits at different time of year, obviously mm -hmm. as well. Well, you know, there's apple, apple pectin, you know, so like if you wanted, if I wanted to make, um, something that's like a little bit more neutral and I didn't want to buy pectin from the store. I can use apple. Um, you know, some of these, a lot, lots of apples have, all of them actually have really good pectin in them. All right. This is my last one. So to extract the pectin from an apple, they just got to go to the website and Google, I don't know Google how it or whatever. No, you just, <laughs> no, you, 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 you can, um, you know, get like make it into like you can crush it up and then Got it. Okay. and add it to your mm -hmm. your stuff. All right, so now I'm ready to cut this into what I want it to be. But let me uh make my little <laughs> sachet. <laughs> what they call it sachet, sachet, <laughs> sachet of fruit. Yeah, this big old sachet of fruit. And this is gonna be my. My thing. Well, and this is important so you can just pull the whole thing out and you don't have to dig around. Yeah. To... And yep. the cool part about this is like when I should have, I should have left this doubled like you had it. Um, yeah. The cool part about it is like when, when, uh, you have it inside of the, the jam and then you can see the pe the pectin. I'm going to show you when, it, when we pull it out and it cools down or whatever, you know, you're going to, we're going to squeeze and you will see it's like a creamy white. Coming right out of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. That's what's going to help it to set. So, in with the pineapple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in with the pineapple. All right. So. These are long. And. I can stack some of these up. This is what my production looks like when I'm at in the kitchen and doing mass production. The best part of like making a product and and selling it to a customer is like when they know you made it with your hands yourself. You're gonna have you're gonna have a different experience when you eat the the actual fruit. Well, and somebody with like you that works with the farmers that knows exactly where this fruit is coming from, mm -hmm. how it was handled, it makes a, a big difference. Um, yeah, I get to, to people out there. I get to see where they're. I get to see where they're uh, growing the fruit, growing the product, um, the conditions that they're growing it under. Um, 
you know, and it's kind of cool to be a part of the process. So, um, there's some other stuff that I got going on that I wanted to share. Um, as then I'm working with the Washington Agricultural, wait, Washington State Agricultural Department um, and Oregon State Agriculture Department. Um, I'm a, I got accepted into their farm, their farm to food accelerator. Ooh. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's pretty cool because it helps um, women and also women of color, um, you know, learn all the steps to to what it takes to um, have a to create a value added product uh -huh. and how you work with farmers and and some folks are working with bees. And it's really cool to be in this cohort of people who are just doing different things with food to see everybody's uh, talents being put forth to create wealth for themselves. It's pretty cool. All right. Yay. I'm done. <laughs> Beautiful Julianne. Look nice. at that. Yeah. Excellent yeah. Night for it. Yep. All right. So we're going to turn this on. Um, oh, it's a oh. wait. Do it clicks all the way to the right. All Keep the going. way. Right, right, right. The other way. Yep. Okay, there we go. Until it clicks. You said to the right. Mm hmm Okay. All right. Isn't that right? Is that right? Or left? <laughs> it was to the left. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is how many cups of Four water? Cups. Four cups. Okay. Four and a half. Four cups of water. And I'm gonna put in oh, then I got some some passion fruit, okay. Goya passion fruit um, puree because um I just really like this flavor. I like oranges and passion fruit and mango. You know? So so if it was in season, could you just do fresh? Yeah, passion fruit? yeah, oh, okay. for sure. Right. Yeah, right. which will be even nicer because then the texture will be different. And you just let it cook down the same way you mm -hmm. chop it up. And yep. Chop it up. Okay. And then um, then we have to put in the sugar. It's four cups. Four cups of sugar. And you need to strain that thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I need some. I need my juice, too. See, I'm helping. I'm helping. Look at you helping. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> All right. And then, um, thank you. So, yeah. Nice. All right. So now we're just going to let this do its thing. I'm just going to use this ladle to just stir it up a little bit here. Normally, you would use a wooden spoon. But we at home. Yeah. So if you don't have a wooden spoon, use something. And and the wooden spoon just because. Well, it, it's good because it's like, you know, not reactive, you uh -huh. know, when you're working with fruit and stuff like that. And I don't know. I just like using a wooden spoon, period, when I'm baking and, and doing anything with sweets. So it works out nicely. So we're gonna let this come to See that's well. I'm gonna add that's 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 the one thing we can agree on as pastry and savory chef. I love to use a wood spoon for my eggs. For really, you your it. eggs, really? Oh, oh, heck yeah! Nice. No playing around. All right. So now at this point, we're gonna let this do its thing, come to a boil, cook. All right. So we took a little break, and uh, just to let this cook and. Can we look inside the pot and see how lovely this is boiling? It's already there. You can see the little sachet there as well. And um, so what we did, what I did was I let it cook to a uh, temperature of uh, 212, 218 degrees. You can go anywhere between 218 to 222 actually. And so at this point, I'm gonna remove this lovely sachet so the sachet again, it had in there the um, 
the rind and the the pith rather the the pith and then also maybe some seeds because that also has um turn that off all right that also has all the pectin in there too so i mean there's still pectin pectin inside of this thing so i mean and that's doing a lot of thickening and adding flavor into that right that marmalade yeah so no, if you so have good. time you can like Take this out and let it kind of cool for a little bit too, and you know, squeeze out the pectin. But we just gonna continue here. So now it's time for us to start putting it into the jars. So pretty, and it smells amazing. I'm gonna put this down here. Okay, so we can um. this. So one of the things um, that you might want to do, and I didn't mention earlier, is um, taking the, the jars and sterilizing them. So some folks might use uh, their dishwasher to, to sterilize, or you can get like a, a pot with some hot water um, and fill it like two thirds of the way. Put like a, um, maybe if you have a rack or anything to put it in the bottom, you can put your gl your glass jars inside there and let it like boil up for about 15 minutes. And that's just normal procedure, sterilize your, your jars. Yep. So that nothing fuzzy starts growing in your... Yeah, because no one wants botulism. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you don't want to put your hands inside. Hot water. Oh my gosh. Scalded hot. This thing right here, I love it. The little jar uh, picks up the jars for you. And you take it like that. And you kind of just lay them out. Sometimes you got to pour water out of them if they flipped over. So as we're sterilizing these jars and yeah. when you fill them, you're going to fill them up Almost to the top. Yeah, just a little almost but to the top. But you leave a little air gap? At least, yeah, about a, like a quarter of an inch at okay. the top. Okay, I'm going to use this as like a lovely funnel. This is like the best thing so you don't make a mess over everything. But another thing we're going to do right now is I'm going to take these lids because they got to get hot too as well. These are like the two-part lids. I don't like these. But uh, it's kind of cool when... Um, you know, you want to do gift giving and stuff like that. So, you know, what happens is, is it'll seal on the top of the jar and then you don't even need the ring anymore. Or you can kind of get a piece of cloth and then put the ring on top. It's cute. But now you can buy jars that don't have the two part lids. Okay. So I'm just going to let those boil up, continue to boil up a little bit just to sterilize the lids as well. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start canning. Look at that. It's all like pretty candy fruit. All right. That's amazing. No. It's going to be so That fun. is beautiful. Look how pretty it is in the jar. Yeah, right about there. So all these items, you can just get it at the grocery store, grocery store, mm -hmm. hardware store. Yeah. The, so the hardware store is pretty cool. I, I found that to be an interesting place to, to find canning stuff. Right. 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 And that's actually where I got my stuff at. But I mean, I've gotten this at uh, especially like some of the smaller tools. And I'll go over that once we're done. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I've even found jars in the grocery store. Yep, you can buy you know, them at the um, at the grocery store as well. Yep. Drug store. I mean, jars are pretty easy to get. Yeah. Jars are pretty easy to get. The tools are too. I'm just so, trying to make sure this is all nice and even. Like so, having enough fruit. So, so once you can this, mm -hmm. and you, you know you got a good seal on it, you can store that up in your 
cabinet for your pantry for what? Months? Yeah, up to uh, 18 months. Whoa. Yeah, up to. But I mean, you can't really, you know, sometimes they say, oh, you can't guarantee the quality and stuff like that. So, but normally if people make jam, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Especially homemade jam. So cool, dry place, it's going to last a yeah, while. Yeah, cold, dark, dry places. I know, I know you said a year, over a year before, so... I can I could do strawberries in season. I could do blueberries in season, and do enough so that it lasts me to that next season. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You can. I like it. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna put a little bit more in here. I got like a little bit of juice left over. Oh, it's so yum. So, so yeah, I don't know. You look how pretty that is. Yeah. So pretty. Yes. Okay. So this is another thing that I really love is this this um it's a lid lifter. And so it has like a little magnet on the top. So oh, you don't yeah. have to stick your fingers in the water to get the lid out. So you got the little magnet and then you just drop everything. Brilliant. I was thinking it was a tapper, but yeah. Yeah. This is like the thing, and especially when you're at the end of your process and you're looking for your your lid, you're trying to get these lids out and you're trying to be quick. So yeah, it does take a while. Sometimes I get <laughs> you get a whole bunch of these in a pot together and <laughs> yeah, and then they start doubling up. You definitely want to. Uh, Make sure your rims are clear and clean and stuff before you. So now, there we go. Got one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick these back inside the water. Okay. I might put a little bit more water on top. And then. Um, it's like. That's like a pressure. That's pressurizing. Yeah, a that's bit, like right? yeah, pressurizing it. It's like the canning process. Yeah, you know, here in the U.S., apparently, like uh, what I learned from some woman, she I was in the class and she was telling me that in the U.K., you know, they pretty much like cook it all the way down, kind of like what we did here. Yeah, um, let it go all the way to this, and then that's it. But in America, we like we gonna cook part halfway, and then we do another time inside. The water bath. So I'm going to go ahead and drop these in. But normally at this point, once these are done, we're done. Do we want to? Um, well, that's really cool. Do we want to stop here? I just think that that's really great. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to be making some jam. And I just want to say, you know, Natalie, thank you so much for joining. Yeah. This is like amazing. I get to thank. Act like a baker here soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody can do that. So um, some of these cool tools, like I said, you got a, a lid lifter. We have a stir. Um, this is something that you would use to like when you're um, working with like other jams, you know, you kind of mix things up, make sure that, you know, release all the air bubbles and kind of pushing things down. And my favorite, this, this jam catcher is like what I like to call it. So... Hey, well, yeah. thank you for being with us. Thank I really you. totally appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It was wonderful making jam with you. And feel free to, you know, text us or or send us a message <laughs> or even check me out on um, Instagram. We be jamming is my bakery concept. So it's WBJ Bakery on Instagram. Now we're going to take a short break from the kitchen and catch up with Jeff. A Fair Start graduate from 2013 and now co-owner of Seattle's iconic Cafe Racer. When I hit my mid-40s, a lifetime of childhood drama sort of caught up with me. I had the whole thing. I had the family, I had the house, all these things that were what I thought was my success. Alcohol became a really good cure for how awful I felt 
and the cure becomes the thing that it really destroys your life. And that's what happened to me. I lost, I literally lost it all. I woke up in a, in a motel room in Everett, not having any idea how I got there. That was my bottom, that was the final day I drank. Fair start had popped into my mind. I had worked for a production company that had done a fundraising video for Fair Start and I was so impressed with their program. And so I opted to move to the shelter and start with Fair Start. I remember at orientation, they put in a, a video for us new students to watch and it was the video that I had helped produce and wrote the music for. Completely surreal experience. The empathy and the kindness and the commitment that Fair Start showed made me feel human again. I had comrades, I had friends, chefs that I could talk to. I had a therapist, they gave me a therapist. And I felt really well taken care of. There was something about being on my feet all day and breaking a good sweat and producing something. I reconnected to myself. My wife shared with me a post on Instagram from Vanishing Seattle that Cafe Racer was closing. And that, to me, felt like Seattle was losing an important part of its culture. I just said, I'm, I'm gonna buy Cafe Racer. I was bound and determined to save Cafe Racer. As a Fair Start graduate, I know how valuable having a Fair Start graduate as part of my team would be. I know that I can count on them. I know that they're gonna be well-trained. I know that they're gonna have courage and they're gonna have loyalty and the accountability and resilience. Having that as part of my team is incredibly valuable Perfect. to me. Thanks, man. Purpose is something that I've been lacking for a long time. And recognizing the value of what purpose meant to me. It was the reason I got out of bed at the William Booth Center to go to Fair Start. It's no different from the reason I get out of the bed every morning to come and run this amazing venue in Seattle. That's what Fair Start gave me, was purpose. I truly don't know where I would be today had I not gone into Fair Start. That is such a great video. Congratulations to Jeff and all his success. And if you're looking for live music and good eats and drink, stop by Cafe Racer in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood. Now I want to introduce to you Chef Brenda McGill of Hitchcock Restaurants. He's going to demonstrate salt pickling, one of my favorite chefs in town. Welcome, Chef Brenda. Thank you, Chef Wayne. Appreciate that. Um, How are you... Um. I see all this wonderful product here. I mean, I'm excited, one, because we're going to extend the life of this product, right? That's right. So we're demonstrating two styles of pickling. One is called shiozuke, and it's sort of a uh, in the class of tsukemono, which are Japanese pickles. It's a very quick way to pickle things if you just want to do it in kind of the same day. And then we're also going to continue that conversation for uh, lactic fermentation, which is uh, where the the beneficial bacteria that live on these are going to basically digest it for us, which will acidify it and make it safe to, to, uh, to preserve for months. Probiotic. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's real good for you. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because uh, you said the name. I, I was trying to catch that, mm -hmm. the actual title of it in Japanese. Right. So and Shiozuke. You say it so easy. like shiozuke. Right. Well, I speak Japanese, so it helps. There you go. Uh, shiozuke means like a white pickle, and what they're talking about is it's more like a more like a blank pickle, it's just salt. And so, salt has an action on plants where it draws moisture across a membrane. So there's moisture inside of here, and when I put salt on the outside, it pulls the moisture across that semi-permeable membrane, and it breaks down the cell structure of the plant. Um, the water comes to the surface, meets the salt, creates brine, and then because of osmosis, that basically injects itself back into the plant. So yeah, I think I think some of these folks might know a little bit about brining out there. Yeah. So yeah, when you say that, that's pretty cool. Okay. 
So uh, what I'm going to do here first is I'm just going to cut these uh, cabbages. And I also have some of these nice uh, green meat daikon radishes. And uh, some of the optional, but I've got some ginger, some young ginger, and some uh, fresh turmeric as well. And I'm just going to prepare these. I'm going to weigh 2% salt, which is about the right amount uh, for this fermentation and also for your palate. Uh, I'm just going to toss it all together. And if we were to let that sit for half an hour to an hour, it would be a tasty shiozuke pickle that we could just serve on the side of a meal. Or okay. we can pack it into this crock. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that will allow enough time so that while weighted down, that action I was talking about where the water comes out, submerges it in its own brine. Okay. And it's basically, you're making sauerkraut at that point. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and prep these vegetables. That, that'd be great. I was yeah. wondering that the turmeric, is that going to change? Is it going to add color? Is it going to... It will. It will change that, that It will. Color. Okay. Yep. So <clears throat> if I were making this a shiozuke pickle, I would probably not add the turmeric and ginger because they would be very sharp in flavor. Um, I would just use something mild like the daikon radish and maybe carrots or other vegetables that you would eat eat raw. But for the longer lactic fermentation... Uh, so due to the fact yeah. <clears throat> that I only introduced you as Chef Brendan from Hitchcock Restaurant, maybe some of the folks would like to know what you're doing, how you've been in business, how your restaurant is going. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been a pretty interesting couple of years. Uh, we, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> we closed most of our restaurants for a short period of time. Started going direct to consumer. We built out a CSA, community supported agriculture, so that um, it's like a mix between a meal kit and having fresh food from a farm delivered at the same time. And that has been a very popular program. Um, we're now back open at our Pizzeria Bruciato on Bainbridge Island. We pivoted our deli and bar on Bainbridge, rebranded as uh, Cafe Hitchcock. And so, you know, as we've been able to reopen, we've been kind of making moves one restaurant at a time. Um, That's awesome. That thank you. So cool. We reopened our downtown restaurants about two months ago. Uh, so Bartolio and Cafe Hitchcock in Seattle are both both open now. A little shorter hours and slightly more limited menus than we had in the, the before times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's, it's coming back. You know. That's good. Good yeah. to hear that, man. Thank you. Congrats on that. And then I'm, I'm noticing when you cut the cabbage, it's pretty much the same one to one and a half inches, two inches much yeah, That's right. Through all those leaves. It's pretty uniform. That's the idea. You know, this stuff is really just to your preference. I mean, you can, you can make it just exactly how you want it. Um, I think what I'll do is set these and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and grab some gloves so I can peel this. So you're saying even I could do it and not mess it up. I think that even you could do it. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, right the turmeric will stain everything. Turmeric is one of those food products. It's also a dye. Um, so, Between that and saffron, I think they used to use that as dyes. Absolutely. Back in the day. That's yeah. right. So I'm just putting my gloves on so I can peel this. Otherwise, um, my fingers will tell the story that I was handling turmeric. And <clears throat> turmeric and ginger are both so good for you in this raw, whole form. It's naturally antibacterial, um, anti-inflammatory, delicious. I think that people should be eating a lot more of this. So, I mean, you're going to get a little bit of that, whether it's dry or the fresh, but you're probably going to get more through the fresh. The enzymes, when it's fresh, are much better. Yeah. You know, ginger, I mean, we've probably all had ginger beer. It's got its own great probiotics in it. Uh, people in the fermenting community, they call it the ginger bug. And <clears throat> it's the sort of thing that there's wonderful beneficial bacteria that show up all across the, you know, the culinary world. So, Mom, I'm just drinking the ginger beer to take care of myself. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you That's know. Awesome. Yeah, Rachel, right. Rachel ginger beer, she's been doing it here in Seattle for a long time and I mean, I remember when she had her little shop just out of the back of Lark. And we, it was all just, know, we all know that's good. Yeah. Fresh ginger mm -hmm. and a little sugar. 
Ginger bug eats the sugar. Tasty probiotic and a beverage. All right, I. Yeah, you can really smell that turmeric. Yeah, it's aromatic, right? Yeah. Snip the ends off of there. Should have got a uh, a little pan for my for my trim. Yeah, I need some compost here. On the island, we feed these to our pigs. Our farm is still operating. We had to slow things down during mm -hmm. COVID, but nice to be back on. So I'm going to use this trusty device, this mandolin, to cut all these vegetables. It's uh, If you don't have one of these, this is a, a Japanese style. And you can just see it gives me really nice uniform slices. Um, I can adjust the thickness on the bottom. Thanks. Got my trim there. Got to work clean, you know? So I'm just going to go ahead and slice these into thin rounds. As you get closer to cutting your fingers, instead of holding it with your fingertips like I'm doing now, I move to hold it with my palm. I would much rather cut my palm than my fingertips. Or nothing at all. Or nothing <laughs> at all. You get a little end nubbin like this. It's kind of, um, it's not very, you know, consistent. So Oblique almost. So no. it's fat and skinny on one end. That's right. So I'm just going to add these here. Make now, a nice is big... everything by weight or just the salt aspect right Every, now? Everything's by weight. Everything by weight. Okay. When you ferment, <clears throat> whether it's vegetables or uh, if I make charcuterie with uh, like a cured meats, the percentage of salt by mass of the item that I'm fermenting is important mm -hmm. and specific. Yeah, yeah. The lactobacillus bacterium enjoys a saline environment which is unique in the world of bacteria. Most bacteria don't like salt, which is why we put salt on things to preserve it. So if we use the right amount of salt, it keeps harmful bacteria from growing and creates an environment in which the lactobacilli thrive. And then those helpful critters eat the sugars in the plant, the carbohydrates, and what they expel is acetic enzymes, which lowers the pH, mm -hmm. which further protects your preserve from harmful bacterial growth. It's uh, it's almost like somebody put all this stuff here for us, you know? Right. It just works together beautifully. Somebody. Yeah. That's all we need is some salt and our food, and we don't need refrigerators. Well, I mean, preserving was huge. Back in the day, because they didn't have refrigeration. Right. Anyway, so a lot of things were salted or cured or, I mean. That's why I call this pre-refrigeration technology. <laughs> somebody, All right. Somebody was smart back then. Yeah. Yep. Well, I will nerd out on the history of salt and humankind and, you know, how we got where we are. You know, but, I'm sure there's a question out there about the salt. We're talking salt. Um, and you have sea salt. You have kosher salt, yeah, all these different salts. What's the preference when you're doing stuff like this? I like sea salt. It's just a, it's a beautiful and pure product. Um, kosher salt is excellent. This kosher diamond that I'm going to use today, it's consistent and, and, and also pure. You know, it's sodium chloride, right? But yeah. sea salt also has, um, you can have minerals in it. And sea salt can bring with it a certain sense of place that is somewhat unique. Whether you're harvesting it from, you know, the shores of Puget Sound and, uh, you know, reducing it into salt crystals, which I know people who do that. Or, uh, you know, if you're somewhere in the tropics and you see a little tide pool, it's making its own little salt crystals. Right. Right. I'll collect salts from all kinds, all places all over the world. But... A nice sea salt, like the baleen brand that you find in most like grocery stores or specialty markets, that's a great option.
All right. It, it sounds like you're more like using just the pure salt. You're not using like black flake salt or something that's going to be really weird in there. Right? right. I wouldn't use a finishing salt per se, like, especially where they add things to it. Yeah. But, um, you know, if it's salt, it won't hurt it. So what I'm going to do here is grab a pan and I'm going to, I'll turn this towards our audience. So I'm going to turn on the scale and it's going to tear out, which is to zero it at this, at this, uh, with this pan on it. So that whatever I add to it, you know, we'll get an accurate weight on. It's just, you're just weighing the vegetables now. Just weighing the vegetables, not the pan. That's right. And I use the metric system because the math is so much easier. And we're dealing with percentages. I tell my kids, you know, like the, the most advanced math I use is, as a chef and businessman is uh, like basic arithmetic, right? Percentages. So we're going to weigh 2% salt for this, which is, it's the right amount of salt for our palate or a quick pickle like shiozuke, but it's also the right amount of salt to get that bacterial, beneficial bacterial growth process that I was describing earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was, let's see, what's it say here? 1650? Yeah. I'm going to. 63. 1665. I'm going to add the you're rest adding, of our. You're adding. Yeah, I'm going to add the rest of it. We're going all in. All right. 1742. So 1% of that would be 17 grams. 2%, 34 grams. So because it's 1742, we're going to 35 grams of salt. going to be 2% of 1.7 kilos. Yeah, that's why you like that metric. <laughs> Yeah, you can't you, you can't do that with ounces. What I say, thirty four. Okay, I'm gonna zero this out again with my cup on here. Take the old kosher diamond salt, known the world around in kitchens. I'm gonna switch my unit to grams, so we're measuring uh a little more accurately. And I think the beauty of doing things by weight. It's always right. That's right. And these scales cost you really nothing. So you might as well have a scale. If you do any home baking or preserving, you just get a scale. Because you don't want to guess. You know, how, how much does a tablespoon of baking powder weigh? Um, you know, that's not really how to get accurate results. So now I know that this salt is 2% of the mass of. Uh, these vegetables, and ideally, I suppose I would probably use a little bit of a bigger bowl, but I'm just going to sprinkle this salt in and then I'm going to start massaging. So, in some, um, like if I were making kimchi and I had whole pieces of cabbage, yep. this would be a really important step how you massage it. Sometimes they start uh, these steps with a brine instead of just going directly with the salt. But all I'm going to try to do here is just mix this in enough so that the salt is evenly distributed throughout. Well, and you can almost see it already, the water, the sheen starting to pop up on that lettuce. It happens immediately. It's fast, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's this great cookbook author and friend of mine. Her name is um, Nancy Singleton Hachisu. She was a uh, American Californian who married a Japanese farmer and has lived outside of Tokyo on an organic farm for the last 30 years. Yeah. Her um, translation of the process of shiozuke is called salt distressing. And I think that it is uh, distressing. It's, it distresses the vegetable. You know, right now you can see that we have these, uh, it's got a pretty good form to it. Like it's crunchy and, and it, it, in its whole form. But after one hour of sitting on your counter like this, everything sort of collapses itself, right? Yeah. And that's because the salt draws the moisture out from the middle, breaks down that cell structure. And, um, 
and that changes the texture. And now, so your your hour is done, let's say. Right. In the bottom of that pan, are you going to have a little bit of a... Uh, there will be liquid. The liquid. Yeah. There will be brine. So if you were just having shiozuke, a little bit of brine in there, you just toss it together. You put this in a little dish to the side of your meal. And it's just a fantastic way to, you know, a, a nice raw garnish like a bento. You'll usually find yeah. foods cooked in different ways. So you have like steamed rice, broiled um, salmon. A little miso and uh, yeah, all these. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And um, so right. something that's gently pickled with salt is just like a, now you're getting your raw food in as well. So if you... I mean, no magic at TV at all. I can see that that was piled up over top of the rim and it's starting mm -hmm. to flatten down True. within there right now. You know, taste one of those and it should be seasoned like the way you would expect, a, you know, like a salad to be seasoned. A little bit on the saltier side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's not like overwhelmingly salty, right? But at this point, it's still got a little bit of crunch to it. That's right. So... This would be the quick, dirty, not dirty, just the, <laughs> the quick, easy, great way to make shiozuke pickles. And if you were to imagine, you know, half yeah. an hour to an hour later. I mean, I could literally take that and put it into a little bowl right now. You could, yeah. And you could just set this like this next to your meal and just enjoy it. And it's great. That's right. At this point, it's basically just like seasoned raw food. But after half an hour to an hour... Once it starts to change and you just yeah. keep kind of massaging it and working it in, then um, then you're going to end up with shiozuke. Now, the next step to do a proper lactic fermentation, I've got this hand-turned uh, Polish crock, which is probably nicer than you need for this amount. Um, you can see inside right here, it's got a well around the top, and that is what creates an airlock with the lid so that I can fill this with water mm -hmm. and it's going to create an environment inside where this releases CO2 that takes up most of the headspace. Once there's actual pressure in it, it'll just bubble out of the water lock mm -hmm. on the top. Um, so I'm going to pack this into the crock and there's great packs for this at home. Uh, one of my favorites is a mason jar kit. You can take gallon mason jars. And um, instead of having the little metal ring that goes inside of the, the band, mm -hmm. yep. it's a uh, plastic, uh, like a plastic layer with a little nipple on it that uh, allows the, the CO2 to escape, but doesn't really let oxygen back in. And then it's got a little glass weight that pushes your item down on the inside. And if you buy those those kits, then you can just use your mason jars that you probably already have at home. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah it's real nice. You don't have to have a Polish hand turn crock to do this. So so we just did a quick ferment, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And that would last how long? Because you're gonna leave it out. You said right. you're gonna leave it out. For yeah, what well, I would leave it out for an hour and then it's ready to enjoy. Yeah. It's not fermented per se at this point but it is um the salt has changed its structure and flavor and look it's already pulling already brine work. out of it right yep, yep. um after so, i was done with dinner i would refrigerate a shiozuke okay, okay. because you're not going to have it in an environment like this that makes it safe for further fermentation and then probably if you eat that the next day it's going to be totally broken down right and it'll be and it'll be good because once it goes into the refrigerator, the enzymatic processes uh, slow way down. They don't entirely stop, but pretty close. So if you want to peek inside of this again, this is a poor demonstration of how to utilize the headspace on a crock. I would fill this up way more mm -hmm. if I were going to go ahead and let this ferment for you know a week. Um, but right now, I put these weights in that's going to press down the item inside. And what you're going to find is that more and more of that liquid is going to come kicking out of there. And what's important is that the liquid completely covers the item within about 24 hours. So I would just check on it. There you go. Pour a little water into the, the lock on the top there. 
and just forget about it. Put it, you know, put it in the cellar. Yeah. So just for these, our guests that are watching, the first one you could keep around in the fridge for what? Three, four, or five days? Weeks. Weeks. And then this one here, because you're going to actually ferment. Right. So this, after about one week, should be getting pretty nice and sour, kind of like a young sauerkraut. And if you were to leave it for a month, it would be uh, really, really pleasantly sour. And the flavor of the ginger and turmeric would really leach out and then permeate everything else. So all the cabbage would be bright golden and yellow. So this is sitting out in what kind of environment? You don't want it in like, a, you know, your solarium. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to put it in the yeah. sauna. Right. Uh, but it's pretty tough, man. I you know, Honestly, um, I, room temperature is but you great. You could do a room, room temperature. It doesn't have to yeah. be in the fridge for a month. I think the standard, like the answer would be to put it in a nice, cool, dark place. There you go. But okay. that will just go slower and slower. Sometimes in our... Uh, we have a Hitchcock Foods is our WSDA inspected um, like fermentation kitchen, uh, food processing plant, they call it. And in our fermenting room, I'll turn the temperature up to maybe 72 degrees if I really want to kind of get it going a little faster. Okay. Uh, traditionally, it would be weather dependent. You know, in the winter, it takes longer to make your crowd. In the summer, it happens a little faster. And that will sit around. I mean, once it's done, you yeah. refrigerate it? Once it's done, you refrigerate it. And that's when it stops souring. So as soon as it's as sour as you like it, then you can just remove it from the crock, pack it until I put it in a jar, put it in the fridge. Same thing. That can last for weeks. It, you know, I mean, hypothetically, kind of forever. I mean, uh, it, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's acidic. It's saline. It's probiotic. It's still living. And uh, it's, it's, it's not going to go bad. The process slows way down. It's like, um, well, the the technical term for the for that is retardation. So everything that's like happening in there happens in extreme slow motion. And they're probably going, why is he just like beating them up with those questions? Jeff has been with us for a long time. He's done some demonstrations for the students, and he gets asked these kind of questions all the time. I mean. It's true. I have a great time working with Fairstar students, and we don't usually do things like this here. I will bring the finished product from these kind of processes to our our Fairstar dinners, and then I'll and then I'll start telling people all about it. Talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is a fantastic. I, I'm I'm gonna go home and like ferment me some stuff. It's so easy to do. I think people think that there's this this magic. It's like real scary, or um, I think even some people in the field they. They guard it a little bit. Like, well, they're worried about it's going to be bad and I'm going to get sick. Right. 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 But even the health department, who is very worried about everything all the time, they don't really, sw the WSDA, there's not the same kind of like protocols to ferment vegetables anywhere near what we go through to dry cure meats or even to do like cooked charcuteries and meats because people don't get sick from this. It, it either works or it doesn't. Right. If it you open this up in a in a week and it smells terrible and all of your cabbage is brown and is weird, then you throw it away because you of course you wouldn't want to eat it. it. Got messed up, yep. right? Yep. Uh, and in general, this stuff is pretty bomb proof. Like I said, it's very old technology. Man, I appreciate you so much coming down and hanging out in the kitchen. We ain't did this in a while because you know. And likewise. But um, I know. This kitchen looks a lot different than it but, usually. But everybody looks like should like here. check out your restaurants. I know the pizza joint. I'm about ready to go get me some of that. Please do. Yeah, our Neapolitan Pizzeria on Bainbridge, uh, Pizzeria Bruciato. We're back open six days a week. We're even doing lunch on the weekend. Great. Uh, we are reopening our older, uh, our original Hitchcock restaurant as a more fine dining, seafood, and vegetable focused restaurant this spring. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah. And then downtown. Bartalio, Roman style and New York style pizzas in the exchange building next to our sweet little all day cafe, the original Cafe Hitchcock. Thank you, Chef. Really Thank you, Chef Wayne. It. Likewise. Always a pleasure. Yes, Thank you. Sir. All right. Thank you, Chef Natalie Evans and Chef Brenda McGill. And a heartfelt thanks to all of you for spending the time, spending this evening with us. You could have been anywhere this evening. You joined us. 
And please join us for the next Guest Chef Night at Home. It's going to be February 24th. I'm going to be bringing in, I'm going to be bringing in from down home, Louisiana, Chef Matt Lewis of You're Where You At, Matt. Finally, Fair Start counts on all of you to do its work. If you can, please donate, volunteer, or help spread the word about our work. Learn more at fairstart.org. Again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you and good night.